Welcome, everybody. Um, the Biochemical Society and the, the Portland Press are pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, which is part of the Biochemical Focus webinar series, which fo features research from different areas in the molecular biosciences, uh, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Um, this, um, this particular webinar um, came about because the Biochemical Society is hosting two exciting uh, uh, events. The third UK workshop of membrane proteins, solubilization and biophysical characterization, um, of which I have a, a minor role in. And this is a hands-on training event that will teach biophysical techniques uh, for the study of uh, biological membranes. And this is mostly targeted at uh, PhD students and, and postdocs who have gone into a slight uh, career change or scientific area change. And this will be immediately followed by the European SMALP event, um, which has been um, following up on earlier SMALP events, um, which is a, 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 like to say, sort of normal conference uh, around the uh, SMA and lipid particle uh, areas, um, of which both speakers uh, of today are also a part. These two events uh, were uh, planned for um, 2021, but um, due to the um, coronavirus, like so many other meetings, um, we have had to delay these to, uh, to 22, as you can see on this slide, um, just so that we're not completely deprived of any um, SMA and SMALP related talks. Um, we're very pleased to organize this webinar um, so we can all stay in touch and hear uh, Tim Dafoorn and Antoinette Killian speaking. So um, thank you both to you for um, uh, agreeing um, to talk to us today. So today's webinar will focus on the methodology of studying membrane proteins, um, structure and function, and, and the solubilization using um, SMALPs. Um, we will first hear from Professor Tom uh, Dafoorn from the University of Birmingham, um, who will outline um, the breakthrough of, uh, of SMALPs in membrane protein solubilization. And this will be uh, followed by uh, Antoinette Killian, who will speak on the, um, on the lipids in these uh, SMALPs and how this will affect solubilization and function. So uh, with that, um, I would like to hand over to Tim, but before we do that, um, I want to tell everybody that questions can be asked uh, at the end of the webinar uh, of both presentations. So um, we will have both presentations of Tim and Antoinette, and then we'll do questions at the end. Uh, and please type any of your questions into the, the question box as shown on the image of, the, of your screen. And uh, importantly, please say uh, who the question is for, or if they're for both uh, speakers today, you can also indicate that they're for both speakers. Thank you very much. And uh, Tim, um, please. Can you see my screen yet? Yes, I can see your screen and it's in presentation mode. Right, okay. Um, so uh, welcome to uh, my talk. Um, I'm gonna be telling you a little bit about um, how we use detergent, uh, non-detergent systems in order to make membrane proteins. Um, and, and in particular, I'm going to tell you about the SMORP system, which is something which we de developed in 2009. Um, so I, as a biologist, I'm always interested in evolution. And actually, um, what we see when we have we develop techniques is an evolution of techniques. And I was thinking about how to explain how our technique, the technique of smorping and more importantly nanodisc formation has evolved um, across time. So I've taken this picture here. This is the evolution of the tree of life, um, something that we as biologists study um, as our daily lives. And taking the same approach where we have time and the evolutionary tree, I've tried to map on what's happened with um, non-detergent systems and um, membrane protein production overall. So I start with the very beginning, the foundation of biochemistry in 1883, Some a, a date actually we could discuss Itself in a, in a, in a, a webinar. Um, and the early stages really were the development of detergents. Um, and these are what majority of people still have been using um, in terms of uh, protein production. And they've worked as they've served us reasonably well. They've got the area kicked off. Um, and in fact, it wasn't until 1986 that the first membrane. And, and just something I wanted, you know, those of you who work on membrane proteins will be very aware of this. It, um, membrane proteins are very difficult to work on. Um, and that's a real indication there, which it, it took us until 86. Membrane protein were a solid. Um, and then as things evolved, amphipoles became apparent um, and people began to show, show that you could use polymers. And I would say this was the emergence of the detergent free world. This is a um, and there's a nomenclature issue here potentially, but really we were looking at different materials um, in order to make membrane proteins, trying to preserve structure and function, which is our overall aim. The big breakthrough really came in um, 1999 with Steve Sligar, who generated peptide nanodisks and showed that you could actually purify a protein, a membrane protein, and reconstitute it into its lipid. 
um, uh, environment. Um, in 2009, we developed the SMALPS, um, and we we feel and we're going to tell you a little bit about the SMALPS today. But the develop just to show the development doesn't cease there, and in fact, we now have DNA um, nanoparticles appearing as well. So overall, you can see that things have grown and things continue to evolve. I'm going to Let's focus really on the styrene uh, malic acid lipid particles. These are a particle that we came upon um, in 2009 and really were the result of um, some work carried out by myself and uh, Michael Overdoing and uh, Tim Knowles. I just come into the membrane protein field from a field where I used to use a gram of protein at a time. It's a soluble. And um, when I came into the membrane protein field, I realized that you couldn't make a, a gram of protein. And in fact, the amount of Small, and it really limited what I was able to do. And I was very lucky to come across um, this method or develop this method, which allowed us to perhaps make more membrane protein and also make it a more stable form. But for those of you who aren't aware about the styrene malic acid lipid particle, here is a, um, a picture of one here, a, a diagram. And what we have is a polymeric annulus made out of a polymer styrene malic acid, the supported lipid bilayer. And you can see in here in the EM, you can see these individual particles. They're about 10 nanometers across. Um, and, and the idea is that you can use this bilayer to support a membrane protein. And by, the, by keeping the membrane protein in that bilayer, you support native like. Now, I'm, this is a schema as to what we actually do. So SMA is a polymer that you can get rel relatively easily. We call it a molecular cookie cutter. It's a very simple material to use. Here's a membrane in gray with our membrane proteins in color that's color. Literally, you add the SMA to the membrane, it acts like a cookie cutter, circles areas of lipid. Now, in some places, it encircles an empty area of lipid, which is not much for anyone, but in, in many cases, it encircles protein. You can wash away the rubbish, and now you have a reagent that contains your membrane proteome, and hopefully, which you can then use for purification. And in fact, the method that you use is fairly straightforward. We like things to be simple in our, in our world. And um, so we take a membrane, we add the SMA polymer, and we clarify the solutions. Turn that uh, membrane layer into a whole solution of. Tim, if um, if I can, I can briefly interrupt you. Um, so you, you you can follow it, but you do uh, you are cutting out um, um, frequently. So if if you could slightly uh, readjust the microphone, thank you very much. Okay, I'll try. Give me a moment. So we, we can follow it, but it is it is cutting out in and out all the time. Okay, I'll try and I'll try and I'll, I'll, see, I'll, I'll see if I can continue a bit louder and see if that works better. Thank uh, you. Um, so the aim is that we can um, we can solubilize the material, we can spin out the insoluble material, and then the material can be separated using conventional chromatography. And we published a paper on this in uh, Nature uh, Protocols, which shows how it can work. Um, and the key, there are a few key steps you need to be clear on, um, but importantly, you need to be low amidazole if you're using his tags, which is a real crucial thing to think about. At no point do we use detergent. The whole thing is detergent. So does it work for a wide range of materials? And the answer is yes. Um, this is a range of proteins that we've worked on over a period of time. We've actually worked on a much wider range than this, but in it shows you the diversity um, the diversity of the samples that you can um, with 36 trans membranes all the way up to uh, beta barrels and samples from different expression systems ranging from um, E. coli through to mammalian cells and different tags as well. Um, you can see this continued all the way down and it goes on um, and in fact our latest uh, record within the lab is 100 trans membranes. Um, so you can see it's got wide utility what you produce, so what you is uh, a material of high stability. Um, you can see here we have um, some stability curve. Um, this is for a G protein coupled receptor. And what you can see is that we have a significant increase in stability over detergent. So this is temperature along here, and this is the amount of active protein left in solution. And you can see that we've got a reduction in um, activity in detergent compared to smalls. The same is true for um, incubations at 37 degrees, 4 degrees, and even freeze thaw, which means that we've produced a much more stable solution than you would normally get in detergent, which is a great advantage to research students working on this material, because it means that you can make your protein and still have a weekend um, and have it stored um, either frozen or at 4 degrees before you go off and do your science. And perhaps most excitingly, 
You can even put um, make the deter make the material into a dried powder, which can be stored for a significant amount of time, or even transferred between labs um, as a dried powder. I'm going to give you a bit of an example, just a quick example of how, what you can use this for using an individual protein that we've studied for. The protein we work on is a protein based in um, cell division. Um, it, here's an E. coli here which is dividing and what you can see coloured in the middle is the division ring. And that's a multi-protein complex, um, the divisome, which is formed um, in between the two new cells um, and they're beginning to divide. Supports, um, the formation of a new membrane and a new cell wall. And we're interested in that, that uh, particular complex because it represents one of the largest um, complexes for remodelling of membranes in, um, in, in bacteria. On the right hand side, you can see a beautiful video, which is um, using um, one of the proteins fluorescently um, labelled. And you can see the formation of the division ring first in the middle, and then you get a second division where it, it, it um, forms in the two daughter cells. Now, we're interested in the proteins and the method mechanisms whereby that cell wall, that membrane is, is remodelled. Now, what was already known was that there's quite a big complex. You can see the complex here, um, and many of those proteins in that complex are membrane proteins, which is not surprising given that what you're looking at is a membrane remodeling um, type of function. So it's important that you understand um, the function of the proteins in their full length form in order to understand the divisome because you have all these transmembrane units. And what we're going to talk about is zip A, which is one of the smaller proteins. It's a single transmembrane protein, which actually anchors uh, the membrane at the, bio at the division site to the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton in this case is called FTSZ and it's a tubulin homologue. Now you can see it in a more cartoon um, scheme here. You've got the membrane at the top here, you've got a zip A which has a single transmembrane, a flexible domain and then a globular domain and that's bound to um, a globular fibrous protein. Um, this protein, this GAF, actually acts to uh, pull the membrane linkage is essential. Now our first stage at, at purifying it, um, we used a zip A um, with a his tag, we purified using um, a two to one ratio of pyrene to maleic acid in our one. We used nickel NTA, so nothing unusual and what we were able to show quite quite clearly is that we've got a nice elution profile of uh, SEC, there's some contaminants down here which we separated quite nicely. Um, the CD spectrum, although a little bit shaggy, shows an alpha beta protein. We can get much better spectra now. This is the original data that we purified. Um, that we've, we also managed to get um, a, a good AUC curve as well. Um, and overall, the proteins seem to be behaving pretty well. Um, you can see here in this it's nice and pure as well. Um, so a nicely behaved protein, which is probably why I chose it, because it's one of the nicest ones we play with. Now, this is the structure that, just to give you an idea as a cartoon that we expected we could see. So you've got the polymer here, here's the polymer. It's a bracelet around the, 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 um, the, the lipid bilayer, as you might expect. And what we'd hoped to have, and what we really got from purification, and we'll see some more structural information. Protein, which is where the transmembrane goes, is still in the disc, and the globular domain is sticking off the... Now, if it has actual function, it should also bind to its partner, which is SZ. And so that's something which we attempted to have a quick look at. Now, there are many ways to look at the way proteins interact with other proteins, but we chose to use analytical ultracentrifugation. Analytical ultracentrifugation, if you, for those who don't know, is a way of, of determining the masses of proteins in solution by measuring how fast they move in a centrifuge. Um, it's a very pure way of looking at complexes, absolute mass, without any requirement to anything else. So you can see here, and um, this is an AUC experiment, and it's a very simple experiment. In red, we have um, the partner protein for our zip A, and you can see it forms a nice single peak. Think of this more like a chromatogram in some ways, or a gel filtration. You can see we've got a clear peak at about 2.5 S, which is the, uh, the measurement of mass in an AUC. And if you look at our small peak, we've also got a, a peak for our zip A, which is at about 4 S. And what's really crucial is when you mix the two together, we get a peak at a higher S, therefore it's a larger particle, which shows that our protein in our small is forming a complex um, with its partner protein, FTSZ. So we've got a really nice example of the 
protein has function in our disc. But we're also lucky in that there's a macromolecular change that, well, um, when we bind FTS said. using EM. So here you can see some fibres of FTSZ. FTSZ will form fibres when you add GTP, like tubulin. And when we add ZIP-A, what's really beautiful is we see little dots appearing along the fibre as our FTSZ pro, oh, FTSZ, okay. the ZIP-A has got a disc on the end because it's in a, in a, um, it's in a smolp and you can see those discs appearing. See one here, one here, one here. Now, if you add even more, what um, ZIP-A does is it bundles the fibre. So again, you can see bundling here, the fibres have bundled together in the EM, and that's good evidence that our protein is functional. Um, and we were really pleased to see that. What we can also do, and this is really leading a bit into what perhaps um, you'll, you'll hear a little bit about from Antoinette, is we've captured the lipids that are around the protein. Now, there's a question in our minds, which was at the site, we know that there's some enrichment in certain amino, certain um, lipids. And the question was, have we captured that in our disk that we're at? The I've cut a lot of work short. This is a targeted mass spec study published in these students. Um, but to cut a long story short, using mass spectrometry, we were able to show an enrichment in cardiolipin. This is the cardiolipin peaks down here. And it was an enrichment um, against the normal lipids that you find in the bilayer. Now that's really interesting because cardiolipin has the potential to change the morphology of the membrane. Um, so we don't know whether maybe, FD, maybe ZIP-A is bringing cardiolipin and changing the morphology or whether ZIP-A is, is, is being moved to a place where the morphology is changing because the lipids have changed. But it shows that you can look at the lipid environment, which is something which I don't think you can do by other method. We decided to take this further. Now, I've got a little bit of a caveat here. Cryo-EM and the um, resolution revolution, some of you may have now it enables you to look at um, atoms. Um, in fact, my wife is a cryo-electron micro beautiful structures now using her EM systems. Now, this is done before those beautiful systems were available, but we asked the question, we use our disks to get some cryo-EM data. Now, I asked my wife whether she would be happy for us to put, a, put these in her machine, and she pointed out that at 50 kilodaltons, you'd never see anything. And this wasn't a Titan Krios. This is a, a much older machine. But we decided to give it a go anyway. And here are our particles. They're tiny. But what you can see is actually when you do the reconstruction, you get something which makes logical sense. You have a disc at the top. Remember, we have a single transmembrane in our disc. The disc is actually on its side. And then the bottom, you've got a globular domain, which is the ZIP-A globular domain. And our structure, well, the structure which is out there in the database of the globular domain fits beautifully in the density. So we're really chuffed. And in fact, if you want to look around there now, really are using this method to get um, atomic resolution data from larger. We decided to push this further and we decided to use other low resolution structural. And to summarize this slide in a relatively short time, we showed that you can use small angle X-ray scattering, and this is a small angle X-ray scattering structure, and small angle neutron scattering, to similar structures that all agree. They all have this two lobe structure where you've got the disc at the top and the protein sticking out at the bottom. Really interesting with the SANS data is you can play around with the amount of D2O in the in the uh, in the uh, um, solvent, and by doing so, you can actually remove bits of the structure selectively. So you can remove either the lipids or the polymer. And we did this, and what you can see is as you remove the polymer and the lipid, you start to see the protein. So that confirms that this density here is the protein density, which is a really lovely thing to do. It's so like like you dissolve away the lipids and you're just left with the protein. We're also able to try and do some structures of complexes. So this is a, a low resolution structure of our protein with the partner protein that is part of the, the cytoskeleton in coli. So this is the ZIP-A FDSZ complex. And really helpfully, FDSZ has a prong that sticks out and you can see this up at the top. And then you've got a larger chunk at the bottom, which is the really nice way to look at complex. Bear in mind, this is with the membrane there, so it has the membrane context. So really, to wind round up a little bit here, um, what we've seen is we can use use the disk system to look at in their native environment, and you can begin to paint a picture about protein complexes near the membrane. Now, just contrast that to what you would have done in detergent world, where you'd have extracted and you lost that contextual information that is to do with 
the membrane itself. We can say with the small, is that membrane context around? So we were able to build this sort of schema for um, bacterial division where we know we, we, this is the structure that we would have of our protein um, with the transmembrane unit and our globular domain of zip A, that it forms this complex with the, um, the, the a single monomeric unit of the cytoskeleton. There's actually quite a change that we know we noticed due to some other data in the length of this linker region. So when it's a monomeric complex, you get a short stubby linker. And then when you, as you polymerize this cytoskeleton, here's the polymerization here. We know the orientation polymerization extends, and this, this section lengthens. It's like it's being stretched because this should be forcing or producing some form of force to drive division. Um, and that leads to the overall cell division. But without having the context of the of this um, membrane domain, we wouldn't have been able to get that information. So that's really what I want to talk about. I think the key elements of the small system, which is really important, is that preservation of lipid. I feel like it's us re-engaging with the fact that membrane proteins aren't, they don't survive alone. The membrane itself is an implicit part of the membrane. What you need is tools to understand that, and smalts really allow that. They allow you to make the protein with its native lipids in you to analyze the lipids that are surrounding the protein and they allow you to, to look at the function and the structure of these proteins in their fully intact form. We no longer cut transmembrane domains of our proteins. We always work with them in their full form to get the truth about how biology works at the membrane. Now this work as ever requires quite a lot of people and I just to summarize here we have a big group in Birmingham who work on these. Sarah, Rosemary and you Pin did the work on Zippe. Um, we work with biophysicists, um, Corinne is actually my wife who did the cryo-EM and Dave Roper who's a microbiologist of some renown who, um, under, who's really the driving force behind the biology of this system. Bob and Richard um, over in Manchester helps us collect data. Bath and uh, with Karen and Cecilia did all our scattering work and some work I wasn't able to tell you about was how we were able to look at the dynamics of the protein as well using computational methods with Sarah and Ben. Um, and, and Anne um, at Lund was also implicit in helping us collect the scattering data. Um, and that's that's me, I think. Thank you for listening. Can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Yeah, Good. and I can too. Thank you. Yeah. So I first uh, would like to thank uh, Lars for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here and uh, talk a little bit about our work in Utrecht. So the work I'm going to share today with you is uh, the work, uh, some of the work carried out by uh, six uh, very talented people in Utrecht. So Martijn, a technician who, uh, who started out the uh, work on the SM8. So he was the one to first uh, visit Tim's lab and um, go there and try to isolate the KCSA channel. Then um, former master students, Stefan, Jonas and Juan. And I think uh, most of the small people, they know Stefan because of his work with uh, polysciences now. Uh, Helene, who's a former master student, and Adrian, master student, and Adrian, who is uh, finishing up his uh, PhD uh, at the end of this year. Unfortunately, I would have liked to keep him longer. Uh, but most of you uh, know Adrian as well because he has been uh, presenting uh, uh, quite regularly at uh, small meetings. So the special thing about the SMA is that it is able to solubilize the membranes um, together with the surrounding lipids. And this implies that it acts on lipids and it means that you can also uh, make nanodisks out of model membranes, out of simple model membranes. And also in these model membranes you get very nice nanodisks uh, shown here. This is a negative stain. Uh, EM picture and then uh, stained with uh, tongue state and then you see these nice uh, rouleau, they, the nanodisks stack on top of, top of each other so you can see how um, yeah that, <coughs> that they have uh, similar sizes so they're quite homogeneous um, and because they, they form such um, nice nanodisks like in biological membranes I think this offers a very nice opportunity for uh, using model membranes to get systematic information uh, to by, variatic, by systematic variation of lipid composition and other parameters to try to understand the, uh, the mechanism 
of, um, of solubilization. And you can already get a lot of information by using a very simple technique, and that is just uh, turbidimetry. Uh, so the, as Tim already also showed, the um, so vesicles they, they are turbid, and then when you add the polymer, then you see uh, they, the sample gets clear and you see a decrease in absorbance. Now this allows you to um, uh, to investigate a lot of parameters. So you can look at the role of lipids, for example, the vary the packing of the acyl chains, packing of the head group, vary the phase, go from gel phase to fluid or liquid ordered, vary the charge, the membrane thickness. The same for environmental conditions. You can look at differences in the pH, how it's affected by salt concentration, by temperature, by uh, divalent cations. And you can look at how important are properties of the polymer, like the composition, the length, charge, but also charge density, the homogeneity. So anything you, uh, you fancy. So I would like to start with uh, looking at the role of the lipids and in particular uh, packing lipid packing and the lipid phases. So this is the experiment that uh, Stefan did, uh, looking at DMPC as a function of temperature. And there you see slow solubilization when you are beneath, uh, beneath the phase transition temperature, so in the gel phase. It goes a bit faster when you go to 15 degrees and then at and above the gel phase temperature, uh, the transition temperature, it goes very, very fast. So this suggests that in the fluid phase in general, it goes fast and in the gel phase, it goes slow. And Stefan confirmed this by, uh, make, by using testing different lipids with uh, different transition temperatures. And all the time he saw that if you look at the absorbance after 10 minutes, that was complete solubilization at and above the phase transition temperature for all these lipids, but not below with the exception of the of the very short chain, which is probably not forming a very stable bilayer anyway. So based on this, we, we thought that um, if in the fluid phase stabilization goes, uh, goes smoothly, goes more easily, then if you take a lipid with an unsaturated chain, then it should go very fast. Even at, when it's at room temperature in a fluid phase, it should go fast. So Stefan tried this with the uh, DOPC, which is in the fluid phase. And we were a bit surprised to see at first that um, it, it didn't go very fast. So it, it went much slower than the saturated lipids in the, uh, in the fluid phase. And also the curve looked a bit strange and we don't really understand why. But why would it be more difficult uh, to solubilize the DOPC, this unsaturated chain as compared to the saturated chains? So we thought about this and we thought, well, maybe if in the nanodisks, uh, the, uh, the phenyl group has to insert in between the acyl chains, then maybe this will be more unfavorable for unsaturated chains because the packing, um, th there's much less space in there because the, uh, the area that an, uh, that an unsaturated, unsaturated chain occupies is much larger than the area for a saturated chain. Now, how to test this? Uh, we thought about this and came up with the following experiment. So we took phosphatidylcholine and then we incorporated uh, lysolipid, lysopc, so the same head group but only one acyl chain. This by itself likes to um, adopt curved structures and it can be included in the membrane. And then, uh, of course, there's much more space between the acyl chains but not between the head groups. If you uh, incorporate a PE, phosphatidyl ethanolamine, this has a relatively small head group, uh, likes to sit in, in structures that have, uh, in which it can adopt this shape. But if you put it in membranes, then the acyl chains get squeezed together much more. So you have a much more tighter packing in the inner part of the membrane. So if indeed the tight packing of the acyl chains would be the explanation, then you would expect the solubilization by SMA to go much, much slower in the PE containing uh, bilayers. Did this happen? Yes. 
here, here are the results that uh, the Stefan got. So this is the regular DOPC. When you include the light OPC, much more space between the acyl chains, it goes immediately very, very fast. But when you include a PE, which has tighter packing in the acyl chains, then it uh, goes very slowly. So this uh, brings me to, um, to like a model that uh, Stefan then proposed that uh, uh, also based on, on many more experiments that there's a third step in the solubilization is membrane binding. And the parameters that are important there uh, are the, um, the SMA concentration, the uh, salt concentration for which we found an optimum, the pH where there was also an optimum, and if you have negatively charged lipids in the membrane, then uh, as, as you would expect, it goes slower. Then there's the second and the third step. So the second step first, like some kind of membrane perturbation. We don't know what it exactly means, but it's necessary to go to the uh, formation of the nanodisks. And these two steps, they will depend very much on the lipid packing. So the tighter the packing, the more difficult these steps are. But they will also depend on bilayer thickness. So the more thick, the thicker the membrane, uh, the more difficult it is to uh, rupture it and to form these uh, nanodisks. I want to uh, focus now a little bit on the polymer and especially uh, on the role of the length of the polymers. So uh, polymers were com commercially available in uh, various lengths. Uh, but they were uh, all these uh, polymer compositions were quite heterogeneous. So the length, the average length that were available, 120 kD, 80, 24, and 10 kD, uh, were tested all by uh, Martijn in the group. And what he saw was that the shortest polymers, that they were the most efficient solubilizers. Now this was also found biological membranes by Kerry Morrison in uh, Alice's, uh, Rodney's, Alice Rodney's lab and also by Dave Stainsbury in uh, Mike Jones's lab. Um, well, we thought about this. The, if the 10 kD, if this polymer works the best of all, then it would be worthwhile to try to um, get shorter polymers and see if they would uh, work better than this one. Um, and Martijn then uh, came up with, a, with an approach to do this. So the polymers are all very well soluble in acetone. But if you start adding hexane to the acetone, then uh, first the longer polymers will precipitate out. And then if you add more and more hexane, more and more shorter polymers will precipitate. So he could purify some fractions of polymers. And then he investigated uh, um, the effect of those fractions. And the result is here, again in uh, DMPC. And in this system, so the shorter the polymers, again, the better the solubilization. So the conditions were different than in the last experiment. Uh, so to, uh, to make sure that, uh, that we could see uh, the differences uh, between the polymers. And the original mixture from which it was purified. There was the uh, SMA 2 to 1 mix. There was um, in between the two largest fractions. Now this, this was solubilized or these fragments were obtained by preferential solubilization. Um, in the meantime, also uh, Randy Cunningham, he prepared uh, and, and built uh, Klumpermann. They uh, designed uh, um, a very ingenious method to uh, to synthesize length controlled and sequence controlled polymers. And uh, these we also tested and um, they gave a very similar result. So the shortest one was the most effective. So how about biological membranes? Um, if you now look at the polymers, and this is an E. coli membrane, it's a membrane preparation of E. coli. Then we again see that the, um, the largest one is solubilizing a bit. Uh, the uh, second to large one is doing it a little bit better. The SMA mix is in between. But now the two shortest fractions 
the 1.4 kD and the 1.1 kD are very ineffective. They increase the, uh, the absorbance. There could be several reasons for this. We don't know exactly what causes it. But because um, to, to make sure that this is not an artifact because we are looking at some OD artifact, we also wanted to see whether uh, how this length dependent, dependence uh, was reflected in solubilization of a membrane protein. So we looked at the KCSA uh, protein, sort of pet protein of us, um, expressed it in KCSA and looked at the solubilization efficiency of the different fractions. And like the OD measurements, so there was some solubilization for the 4.6, much better for the uh, 2.41, the SMA mix in between, and no solubilization for the shortest ones. So how can we um, explain this difference between the model membranes and the biological membranes? And how can we explain the length dependence at all? We, we are still working on it, but our tentative working model at this moment is the cooperativity hypothesis. And this says that if you have small polymers, um, they are less effective or they, um, if you look in biological membranes with small polymers, they can be less effective because uh, perturbation of the membrane, uh, enough perturbation of the membrane to get a nanodisks is more difficult in biological membranes than in model membranes. And this perturbation requires a, requires a concerted effort, so cooperativity of polymer units. And this happens more easily, uh, or this is too difficult when, when the fragments get too short. And when you go to longer polymers, then uh, our hypothesis is that there's a loss of efficiency because uh, these polymers, they, they each uh, do their own thing and they don't uh, cooperate efficiently, efficiently anymore. And they may even start to get entangled and uh, then you get steric hindrance. And then, uh, yeah, depending on the membrane system and how difficult uh, the membrane um, perturbation is, then uh, you get a size that is uh, perfectly right for the, for the system, just the right length, the Goldilocks length, and with this, then you can uh, uh, you can most efficiently extract uh, uh, the proteins. So then, if you extract the proteins, you get the nanodisks. Now there are many exciting new developments uh, in, in the field. Many papers coming out doing uh, fancy things with uh, um, you know, looking at membrane protein structure and and dynamics and. Uh, very interesting work, but I would like to give a few examples of what you can do with uh, with these nanodisks uh, based on our own work uh, on KCSA. So first, the KCSA nanodisks, you can of course characterize them easily with uh, electron microscopy, and you see the 10 nanometer particles. You can do, you can do a circular dichroism, a very nice CD spectra showing an alpha helix very similar to what you would get in DDM. And you can look at the stability as a function of temperature. And you see when you go to higher temperature, um, uh, even 95 degrees, which is a pretty, pretty high temperature, the alpha helix is still intact. But if you do the same for the, uh, for the KCSA in DDM, then it loses most, most of its structure. Now, recent experiments, which I'm very excited about, uh, carried out in, uh, uh, in the lab of uh, Philip Kukura, uh, together with uh, Anna Olerinjova. Um, they, they developed a new method called mass photometry, uh, which, is a, uh, which is a method based on, uh, it's a single molecule method uh, based on light scattering. And you can get um, information about the size of the particles, of individual particles. And uh, what they saw was for these uh, KCSA, KCSA containing SMOPs that they were about 250 kD uh, in weight. So Adrian then um, analyzed these particles biochemically and determined the protein lipid ratio. 
and he found the protein lipid ratio of about 1 to 40, or a tetramer lipid ratio, I should say, about 1 to 40. And there was only one uh, likely way in which, based on this, the nanodisks could be composed, and there would be two KCSA, two KCSA tetramers, about 84 lipids, and about 10 polymers. So if you would have one KCSA tetramer, then you would need about 200 lipids, and that is very much deviated from this value here. And if you would have only, uh, or if you would have three, then you wouldn't have any lipids anymore, so that also wouldn't fit. And of course, this uh, 30KD is an assumption, but it, it won't deviate more than, uh, it won't deviate too much from that. So this means that um, apparently the, um, the SMA is able to, uh, uh, to disrupt the, the membrane in an even more gentle way than, uh, which we already knew, of course, but in a more gentle way than, uh, uh, than detergent, in which it stays together as a tetramer. We know that in biological membranes, uh, KCSA can form those superclusters. And apparently, some of those are, or th those are preser preserved as dimers in, uh, in uh, SMA solubilized nanodisks. Then uh, another short example. So the um, biochemical characterization of the lipid composition, very similar to what, uh, to what Tim uh, showed. So we also find, found here, this is the total fraction, the solubilized fraction. In the purified nanodisks, that cardiolipin, like in Tim's example, the cardiolipin is enriched here. So we found a little quantification, a little bit enrichment of cardiolipin uh, in the nanodisks and also of the negatively charged PG and reduced PE. So that could mean that um, the KCSA is actively recruiting those, pro those lipids. And this would be in line with uh, studies by Tony Lee based on fluorescence. But it could also mean that, uh, uh, that the KCSA is uh, preferentially partitioning at the poles in the E. coli. There is also enrichment of cardiolipin and, uh, uh, and PG. And the final thing I want to show is then the functional characterization. So KCSA is a potassium channel. When you add the nanodisks, to one side of a chamber uh, separated by a lipid bilayer of E. coli lipids, then a few minutes later you can see uh, uh, conductivity traces appearing, and these are characteristic of, characteristic of KCSA. So it's incorporated in a functional form. And the implication, of course, is that this is an example that we have spontaneous transfer. So the if the if the KCSA is added at this point. Uh, at pH 7. It needs pH 4 for the, to be activated, and the pH 4 is needed at this side of the molecule. So it, it means that these traces are coming from molecules which have translocated with their C-terminus and their N-terminus across the, across the membrane. So I would like to leave to this for the, uh, for the uh, experiments, and then briefly look at the future because I think there are lots of exciting things uh, happening in the, in the field of the polymers. Um, and I think the, the big challenges will be uh, to really understand the mechanism of solubilization, so the roles of the membrane, the polymer, roles of environmental conditions, also to understand what determines the properties of the nanodisks, so what determines the size, the dynamics, not only of the um, so the dynamics of the polymer, of the lipids, of the protein in the nanodisc, what determines the stability. And if we understand this, all this can lead to a rational design of new ge generations of polymers. Uh, of course, many new polymers already uh, have been made and tested, and these help in turn to further understand this mechanism and also understand the properties of the nanodisc. And I look very much forward to uh, the next few few years and see the branches on the, on Tim's uh, evolutionary tree grow with uh, all these new generations. Then with that, I'd like to leave it and thank the people uh, involved in the uh, thank the people involved in this work, 
Uh, so the Utrecht uh, small group, this is in red, the present group, and these are former members of the group, collaborators, Tim, Beth, uh, Dave and Mike, Anna and Philip, the funding bodies, and of course also polyscience with Stefan, who've been uh, uh, generous in uh, giving us the, uh, the polymers. Uh, yeah, this was it. Uh, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you again, both uh, Antoinette and Tim, for two, two wonderful talks. Um, we have uh, several questions in the um, in the question box, but um, to all the uh, the audience, please keep those questions coming. Um, the the first couple of questions are um, for Tim because the, as the questions sort of appeared during the uh, uh, the presentations, um, you know, Tim spoke first. Tim, I mm -hmm. understand you've changed your camera, um, so maybe you can say something to make sure that the camera uh, not the camera, sorry, the microphone works now. Does that work? Is that any good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can uh, we can hear you well. Thank you very much. So uh, the first question um, was actually asked to you, Tim, but I think it, it applies uh, to both of you. So uh, maybe you can both give a, a, an answer um, by Jack Leo, which is: um, Does the the small disc um, is it fixed in size, or does it naturally contour around a, a protein? So can it go around a larger protein and change the size of the of the small? So from what we know, it has some flexibility built in. So we monitor what people have been able to solubilize. And for a while, we thought that you could get up to about 51 transmembranes as a structure by Bob Guinness in science of the structure of a, a cytochrome at 51 transmembranes. Now, if you look at that structure, there's very little lipid. There's just the tightly bound lipids around it, but it's still there. Um, but we've recently, and I can't say what the protein is, but we've got a protein in which is 100 transmembranes. So our, it's a super complex. So our suspicion is it's a bit of an elasticated belt. But once you get over a certain size, what happens is you lose some of the lipids and you get a much tighter belt around the protein. Um, and there's a question to be asked there about whether that's still in the membrane. And that's something we want to look into as we go forwards. But we know those proteins are stable. And the ones we've got 100 transmembrane has 100 percent activity. So that means it must be quite stable. Antoinette, I assume you, you found the same? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I agree with Tim. Uh, I would like to add that, uh, um, that the size of the, um, the preferred size of the, of the disks also seem to uh, very much uh, depend on the nature of the polymer in a way that we don't understand, that we don't really understand yet. So more, more to do in that area. Um, the next question um, for Tim uh, is from Stefan Frielingsdorf uh, from Berlin. Um, the, your peak in the uh, AUC uh, looked pretty broad. Um, is it possible to determine the molecular mass of a membrane protein complex uh, in a SMOLP by subtracting, subtracting the empty SMOLP mass? So yes, um, we've had something we've not published. We, um, what we used to do was to actually have a SMOLP in there and then do some subtraction, which is not totally correct. Um, and you can get quite a good estimation of mass, but we've done some work with some guys in France looking at deuterium. So you can play around with deuterium and water ratios and then do a sort of simultaneous equation and then it can be quite effective. But actually, we sort of found a simpler way, which is um, we published recently a paper called SMAR Page, which is a polychromide gel electrophoresis technique based on using the polymer as the SDS, if you like, but with a protein that we know is stable and is still folded. And there, if you look at that paper, we get molecular masses, which are incredibly um, accurate, way more accurate than we expected, if I'm honest. Um, so that's a really quick way to work out whether you've got a complex and what that molecular mass is without even troubling an AUC. Thanks. Um, the next question was again to Tim, but I think it applies to both of you. This was asked when you were still speaking on tonight. Uh, from um, Adam um, Sveshik, Swesh uh, apologies if I pronounce your surname incorrectly, Adam. Um, how about reconstitution of polymer nanodisc disc proteins into artificial membranes such as liposomes? So this is always the, the reconstitution back into a into a lipid system. Yeah. It's a very so, general question, but. <laughs> can I answer that? So there's a Swedish group uh, from uh, Peter Brzezinski. Uh, they have, uh, or, or is that what you were referring to? Uh, the, the question is very general, but I think that um, you, you're referring yeah. to his um, scientific reports paper, I assume. I think that would be a good answer, yeah. <laughs> yes, so what they did is uh, is they had the nano disks and they uh, um, put them through the extruder together with, uh, with vesicles. 
and then they found that it uh, got incorporated into into the membrane and they also did a co-sonication procedure and there it also uh, worked out well and we tried we also tried those uh, things but in our hands it was uh, sort of not uh, not straightforward and it was also difficult to uh, uh, to establish whether the the protein was really incorporated in the bilayer or maybe there was a a nano disk nano disk included in in the vesicle so um uh we we've tried some but but not succeeded really yet but but the the, the results in the paper they, they look very good but in your plane and membrane experiment you presented at the end we know that at least to some degree proteins do transfer yes, yes. yeah yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, there's 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 also there's also some work done which was done by Dr. Alice Rothney in Aston, um, where we played around with a little bit with um, so the polymer falls out of solution at the, at a low pH or with divalent cations, and you can use that to try and reduce the stability of the of of the particle in the presence of lipid. And we've had there's been some positive results there. But the trouble is it's it, it's a good way of wasting a lot of protein if it doesn't work and people tend to want to keep their proteins to play with. But I think there's more work to be done. Yeah. May I add something on the uh, yes, please. membranes because uh, so what we found there is uh, you actually get the fusion or get the transfer of the protein to the membrane. But you, you should keep in mind there that uh, just one protein would be would give you these results. It's enough for these results. And also the way the membrane is prepared is with the uh, with um, uh, what is it octanol or something or dodec dodecanol. And so that 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 is at the torus of the of the bilayer. So maybe that changes the properties a little bit. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's every model system has its own sort of. Uh features yep. um to, to the general audience we have a, a number of really good questions that also means that um i won't be able to ask them all so apologies i'm now having to be a a, a bit randomly selective um it, it shows the the, the the major interest in in both talks um so um the um yes so a question from antoinette um uh, who, uh, by uh, sana amir or amir again apologies for my pronunciation um, thank you for the very interesting talk. Do you think uh, we can have more than one protein in the nano disk of SMALP? And um, you've showed at the very end two um, two cases, uh, two two ion channels. But maybe also, can you have accidentally multiple proteins? You know, different proteins um, solubilized in a single small particle. Yeah, uh, I think it's very very well possible. Yeah, depending on how large they are and how close they are together. So. If they form a complex, then of course you find them in all the nano disk. And if it's just by by coincidence that they are together, then you won't easily find them because because it's it's just in one out of many nano disks. But I think it's definitely possible because complexes are also formed and and trapped. And if Tim can even have a complex of like hundred tens membrane segments, then yes. And so also. Yeah. So Tim, do you sometimes see co-purification, not as in a, in a real stable quaternary complex, but as sort of um, you know some kind of affinity? Yeah, I mean it's interesting. One of the things we're quite interested in is using the disks to sample complex membrane protein complex space on 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 um, whole cells. So I think you really do get a snapshot, and because it's quite elasticated you get a snapshot of all the different complexes and then it's about deconvolving them. So we've actually been doing some work on COVID and you can begin to pull out complexes there that you didn't expect. You can pull down ACE2 and you can get other proteins that bind to it as well. So I think it's it's a great opportunity. To, in some ways, it does away with the artifactual issues that you get with, um, with cross-linking. Yep. Because if it's in the disk and you find a lot of it, it's probably a real complex, I think. Thanks. Um, I'm going to a question of uh, Annalisa Mola because um, she has a similar issue that we have tried to uh, battle with. Is that um, for Tim? Is it possible to prepare SMALPs from mammalian cell lines expressing a transmembrane protein having a strap uh, affinity tag? Um, is a is a is a his tag for any reason better than a strap? So we we have we have done it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I can't. I think it was from. A, it, we're not sure which cell line it was from. And what we noticed was the strep had a massive affinity for the 
um, for the resin. So my student was doing it and she knocked, she got no protein out and couldn't work out where it had gone. And an old biochemist trick is to take a bit of the resin and run it on the gel. And there was a huge amount of the material still stuck on the gel. So there's your question as to whether it's affinity bound or whether it's just aggregated. But she added more of the release ligand and out it came. Now that's a once not every time but she needed something like five to ten times more of the affinity ligand to knock it off so i'm not sure why that is it may be that there's also and you also what i can give as a hint is if you do get non-specific interactions adding some arginine which is an old again an old biochemistry trick will really help knock things off col off columns and it really aids it and we've done a quite a bit of that the polymer can be quite sticky if you think about it because it's got quite a lot of charge so i think yes we use his tags because the lab uses his tags and we've got protocols that work. Okay, but other tags might might also work. Um, um, a question um, from um, Sayed Tabe uh, for uh, Professor Killian: uh, Do do lipid nanodisks fuse together and form large ones uh, upon dilution? I assume this question is for after the, the initial smalls are formed. If you if you store them, can you repeat? Okay. So if, if I if I the way I understand the question, if you have two nanodisks which are initially formed in solution, could these fuse to create one larger nanodisk? So could there be you know um, lateral interaction between proteins in on longer time scales? Or once the disk is formed, it's really really stable, um, you know at least uh, kinetically. I think this this is one of the, it's a relatively stable, uh, but but these are things that are still so very little known and, and explored about the dynamics so we know that, that there are dynamics that, that the polymer can go off and go on and also lipids can exchange between uh, between nano discs and i wouldn't be surprised if fusion is also a possibility depending on the stability of the system depending on maybe the bilayer composition the the, uh, the polymer composition the the uh, the excess of uh, of polymer so there's a lots of parameters involved, and I think that there's much more studies to, to be done. Okay, um, a question from uh, Alice Rodney, um, um, which of course is well known uh, to both of us, um, to all of us. To Antoinette again, do you think the me um, the same medium-sized polymers are optimal for the different biological membranes? So we we comparing bacteria, yeast, mammalian cells, and so on, or might there be a different optimal optimum for all these membranes? I would think there might be a different optimum because E. coli lipids they are very rich in uh, in PE, so this uh, so th they're they're much more difficult to solubilize I think than most other uh, biological membranes, so th there may be a difference. So, so it, yeah. Okay. Thank Just you. A, um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We we've we've run out of time. I'm afraid. Um, I have several uh, interesting questions still on the. Uh, on the chat here, but um, and we're reaching four o'clock. Um, I want to do a, a couple of closing uh, announcements. Um, so, of course, um, thank you again, both speakers, uh, uh, for your wonderful presentations and, and the conversation that uh, happened afterwards. Um, you can follow um, both of you on, on Twitter uh, and, um, and tag them, please, in your comments, and as well as this presentation today, because it's, uh, it's recorded and can still be, be seen afterwards. Um, if uh, for the audience, if you have any ideas for a topic to be included in a future webinar series, uh, please do let us know. You can submit uh, webinar proposals on the on the website of the Biochemical Society, um, and it's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, as I have also found out when I uh, proposed uh, this particular webinar. Um, the next uh, biochemistry focused webinar series is on the on the 15th of April, where we welcome Dr. Stefan uh, Uphoff, the winner of the 2020 Colworth Medal to present this award lecture on DNA repair um, and um, mutagenesis in bacteria. So please uh, register for that. And then finally, um, I want to highlight um, that it's more than ever to stay connected. Um, so joining the Biochemical Society community of researchers and spe specialists um, is a great way to stay in touch with all our fe uh, fellow, re um, fellow researchers and uh, the, the wider society uh, of, of scientists. Um, so please um, do also consider becoming a member of the Biochemical Society if you're not already um, are so, um, which gives you conclusive, uh, exclusive access to a wide range of grants and bursaries uh, and per a personal online access to two journals. Thank you all for your uh, contributions uh, and goodbye until the next webinar. <laughs>